Subject is art. 
Yo, hombre. I'm a puppy monster. <laughs> <laughs> We did uh, the interspersed box with videos of Maharaj. And then within that, there was also videos of Sindhu Devari, Shiva Ramaj, Radhanaswami, So they also be pre recorded. And then uh, the police were talking. And and then we had uh, police punch. Never mind. And then they also had slideshows of Maharaj being displayed. What's the red yeah, it's the second school. Oh, I want to say to me, yes, 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 <laughs> yeah, it was a nice project. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're on. Nice. We need a spatula also. Yeah. A spatula, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. I will cut and distribute. Wow. You, have to, you have to find a way how to online to distribute as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll take some. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she's good. She's got Shakti. <laughs> Bekti Shakti. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. Am I online yet? Yes, you are. Yeah. 
So I've got the back to God head, a sweater, and uh, at the moment, this is the only one I could get. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. So I've got two packets. Great. The back to go the head and the sweater. Okay, great. Sweater is kind of unique. You can leave it in your room. For the class? Yeah. I will be my issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yours. This is all. Hmm? Huh? Sorry. Am I online? Yes, good morning. Uh, so today we are celebrating. We're, ce we're celebrating Swedish. Oh, no, I'll, 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 I'll yeah, we're celebrating three different occasions today. Panchakalpa, Tarubhishya, Kripa Sindhu, Vaibhishya, Kapitanam, Pavane Vyo, Vaishnava Vyo, Namaha Namaha. Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Siyadvaita Gadadhar, Sivas, Gaur, Bhakti Vrindu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So today is Guru Purnima. It's a day for honoring the spiritual masters, but Particularly, it refers to Vyasadeva, who is the author of Vedic literature, and therefore he is considered to be Veda Vyas. And he is, when we say Vyasa San, we talk about that place where the guru actually sits in order to present the knowledge of the Vedas. It's coming from uh, Veda Vyas, who is the author of the Vedas. 
You can lean it up against the back of the chair, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, today is also Sanatan Goswami's disappearance day. Um, Sri Rup Sanatan Bhattaraguna, Sri Jiva Gopal Bhatt, Das Raghunath Sad Goswami Ki Jai. So in our tradition of devotion, we honor uh, the representatives of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who were the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who are Sad Goswami, so the six Goswami. Sri Rup, Sanatan, Bhatta, Gopal Bhatta, Raghunath Bhatta, uh, Sijiva, and also um, Raghunath Das Goswami. So six Goswamis, they are followers. And Sanatan Goswami is considered to be, in one sense, the senior most. Um, in our tradition, we worship the Lord in his different manifestations of devotion. It looks like I'm on mute, right? No, no. audio is going back over. Okay. You can hear. And in that uh, understanding is that there is, uh, the Vedas are divided into three. There is three categories of information within the Vedas. One is called Sambandha. The other one is called Abhideya. And the third is called Prayojana. Sambandha is the knowledge which connects us to Krishna. What is our relationship with Guru? What is our relationship with the material energy? What is our relationship with each other? Relationships is the basic principle of knowledge which sets the foundation for devotional service. Because if you don't know the nature of relationship, you don't know how to act. How one sees the particular aspects of that fit under somebody. Somebody is the biggest category. Which is the beginning of the tradition of the knowledge that we need to know in order to run. You don't have to know what is that relationship that I have with this person who I call my wife and my husband, and I have to know what are my duties that are connected with that relationship. So in the same way, the Vedas are situated in such a way that the foundation for the execution of devotional service is the principle of relationship. And there are different types of relationships. So there is a guru for each of the categories. So the second category is Abhideya. Abhideya is the process. What is bhakti? Which is it consists of the activities of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, worshiping the Lord in his deity form, hearing and understanding Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, any of the activities of devotional service is called Abhideya. But that category is not as voluminous as uh, Sambandha. Sambandha is the largest. And the smallest of all categories is the last category, which is Prayojana. So develop relationships, follow the process, and then you get the goal of the process. There is a goal. What is that goal? Prema Kumarta. Go, uh -huh. would you like a piece of cake? Um, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, this is from Neela Madhava for for the for tradition. Oh, okay. 
I'm a little afraid when I get something from Neil and Marina. <laughs> Uh, uh, so in that category of activities, devotional service may, is a blend of these different, it's called Abhidaya, the process. And then whatever you do has to have a goal. Some people, people do things just for the sake of doing it or don't even know why they're doing it. There is a reason, but they don't even are aware of it. Or sometimes they do it without any understanding. But if you want to be, make something successful, you have to have a goal and be focused on achieving the goal. The process gives us the direction to achieve the goal, but then we have to know what is the goal and what are the characteristics that indicate we are moving in that direction towards the goal. And then ultimately, what is the goal? So that's called cryogen. So, Sambandha, relationship, the process, cryogen. Now, each of these three processes has a needy connected. So, the Sambandha needy is the so Radha Madan Mohan is the Sambandha deity. Now the deity for Abhideya is Govindaji. Govindaji is our deity in the process of devotional service. Minya, Kalpa, Druma, Siratnagar, Sisirata, Govinda Devos, Sali B. Sevyamana, Samar, Smarami. I can't remember that name. But that is the mantra for glorification, Radha Govinda. So Radha Govinda is the deity of, in other words, on that level of practice, Krishna appears to you in that form. Now, when you achieve, or you move, when you actually get close and achieve the goal, then is the ultimate principle of, of devotion in the form of the deity manifestation of pure love. So when we're practicing devotional service, Krishna will appear to us. If we're on the level of Sambandha, he'll appear to us as Madhama. If we are in the process, absorbed in the process of Krishna consciousness, he appears to us as Govinda Ji. And if we are actually moving and attaining to the level of a goal, he reveals himself as Gopi. So when you when you're when you're worshiping your particular deity, the deity is coming to you through either one of these three forms of himself. Either some Lumadan Mohan, Govinda Ji. Of Gopinath. Now in Vindavan, we have Radha Ramanji. Radha Ramanji is the manifestation of all three deities in one. All three deities in one. And each of the deities and the process has a particular guru connected with it. So the Sambandha guru is Sanatana Goswami. The Abhideya Guru is Rupa Goswami. And the Prayojana Guru is Raghunath Das. So you see how organized the process is in relationship, process, and then ultimately goals, 
with deities and gurus attached to each aspect of the process. So we worship Sanatana Goswami as the deity of, relate, of the guru that gives relate, our connection, connects us with the process of Krishna consciousness. And uh, today is his disappearance. What is more important, worshiping the appearance or disappearance? No, it's actually the other way. This appearance is much more important. Why? Why? Because when he, he appears, he hasn't done anything. But only when he disappears, then we can glorify whatever they have done. That's why the traditional culture in, in the Vaishnav society is that for festivals on the appearance day, we usually worship one day. But on the disappearance occasion, we worship three days. The day before the actual day and the day. That's why disappearance is more, actually more deeper and more, you know, complete. We go, should you ask? Welcome. So these, uh, so today we are honoring Sanatana Goswami. Sanatana Goswami, it's mentioned in the Shastras, particularly in Chaitanya Charita, that there's four devotees who can never be in relationship to a particular quality that they exhibit. You cannot imitate, you even understand, you cannot understand the depth of the Never means not moved by the realities of the material. Not moved by how they respond to the request. Not moved by attraction. Not disturbed by request. You cannot imitate the tolerance of Shua Hanidas Tatwani. You cannot imitate Dabadar Pandit, who was one of Lord Chaitanya's associates, who had the, not service, but he accepted the service of correcting Lord Chaitanya. And you know, when Lord Chaitanya apparently, because he's the Lord, that's one thing, but because he's playing the role of a sannyasi, that's another thing. But these roles are somewhat contrary. A service of correcting the Supreme Personality of God. But Sanatana Goswami's humility, one day he went to see Lord Chaitanya. This was in the month of Jaist. Jaist is this month, I think. It's one of the hottest months in India. And uh, in order to get to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had to walk a particular path. So the, the recommended and regular path was that he would have to pass by the Jagannath Temple and then go to where Lord Chaitanya was in the Gambira. But 
One time he came to see Lord Chaitanya and he didn't take that path. He took another path, which was the path along the beach. Now this is Jace and the sands are burning hot. So he was walking across these burning hot sands. When he got to Lord Chaitanya's place, Lord Chaitanya noticed the bottom of his feet was all blisters. And he said to Sanatan, Sanatan, how did you get here? Which way did you come? And Sanatan was at first reluctant to speak, but the Lord was encouraging. And he said, my dear Lord, I took the, the path along the beach. He said, what do you, why did you do that? Why didn't you come by the normal path along the road where Jagannath Temple is? And Sanatana Goswami said, well, my dear Lord, I see that every day the Pujaris, they go in and out and they're serving Jagannath. And so I didn't want to disturb them. So in order to avoid passing by the Pujaris, I took this beach room. And then Lord Chaitanya did with emotion. This is because this was his natural humility. He was willing to undergo some suffering physically in order not to disturb Lord Jagannath you know, Pujaris. So that was one particular story that illustrates the the bhakti or the humility of Sri Sanatana Goswami. Nathan Goswami and Rupa Goswami were uh, employed by the Islamic rulers at the time. Why did they take such positions? They were forced to. Not forced by physical force, but by forced by, in order to protect the Brahmin community. <clears throat> the Islamic rulers, well, at least the, 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 the uh, Kazi and Rupa Goswami were great scholars and they were considered the prime of the entire Brahmin Saras, they were Saraswat Brahmas, not a small Brahmin caste. And therefore he wanted to use them in their government. So he asked them, they refused. But then he said, if you don't come, then we will persecute the Brahmin community. Not you, but the community. So in order to protect the rest of the devotees, they accepted that position. And they gave up their names and they become they became Sakar Mil, Mil, Malik and Dabir Kas. They took on Muslim. And for many years they served the Islamic government in what was that place? Uh, I think it was in they call it the they call it the the, the they call it Vrindavan Gupta. Um, Kanai Natasha. And so uh, after some time, Sanatan Goswami and Rupa Goswami decided to leave. Now, Rupa Goswami left first, he retired. But the uh, Islamic leader didn't want Sanatana Goswami to leave. So one day Sanatana Goswami just decided not to go, in, go to his service for the government. And he continued to do that day after day. Finally, the, the Kasi came to see him. This was in Banaris, actually. He had a place in Banaris. He was staying. So he came 
And he said, Sanatan, you know, I need you. You are here. Because Sanatan came, gave the plea that he was sick. But he actually wasn't sick. He just wanted to come and read Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> and, you know, get away from his service. So the, the Kazi was saying, you know, I have some plans. I, I want to go to the south and do some conquering. And I need you to rule, you know, take over the government when I'm gone. There's no one else. So Sanatan refused to return. And the Kazi became very angry. And then finally he arrested him and put him in jail. And... Uh, so Sanatana Goswami was able to send a message to Rupa Goswami because Rupa Goswami had retired with two boatloads of gold coins because he was also the Minister of Finance. <laughs> but that was what he was due. So Sanatana Goswami said, you know, send me some of those gold coins. I need to get out of this prison. So there was one Muslim guard who was taking care of Sanatha. So he thought, if I can bribe this Muslim guard, then I can get free. And so he sent 10,000 gold coins to Sanatha Goswami by a carrier. Sanatha Goswami now is in jail with 10,000 gold coins. So sometimes you know, generally, devotees are not diplomatic. You know, the devotee is straightforward. There's no duplicity. But in this case, in order to do his service, he used his little diplomacy. Because Lord, Lord Chaitanya was looking where is Sanatan he wanted him. Because Sanatan said he was coming, but then he didn't come. And so this Muslim guard, he was just an ordinary man, not very intelligent. And he started praising him, started glorifying him, started saying he had so many wonderful qualities. And he also said that, you know, he made him feel, you know, like really important and at the same time. Uh, Sanatan Goswami was said, you know, uh, I want to go and I think he had seen my family or somebody. And then he played on the whole idea of family emotions. And then he offered him 5,000 gold coins. Yeah, the brutes to let him free. And then he said, you know, if they're, if they ask what happened, you just tell them you, you took me down to the banks of the river and uh, in order for me to take care of nature. But I jumped in the river with my chains and I was all, but this guy didn't go for it. <laughs> so then Sanatan Goswami offered him all but eight gold coins out of the 10,000. He kept eight gold coins back. And then he took it and he let Sanatan free. Sanatan was traveling all alone. He was trying to reach Lord Chaitanya. But then one assistant joined him, which his name was Ishana. Ishana came to assist Sanatan goes, so how they met up, I don't really know. It doesn't describe, it says he was, and they were passing through different places. And it was dangerous. A lot of times there were Dak whites. And they were one day coming to one kingdom where there was the hotel keeper in the kingdom used to use astrologers to find out who's traveling through. And then he would, you know, rob them. So, and Sanatan happened to come to that hotel to stay overnight. And then uh, Sanatan, after he was there, he could sense that this hotel keeper wasn't right because he was too nice. 
You know, sometimes people are too nice. You've got to be careful. <laughs> that means they have a plan. <laughs> yeah. So, and you can tell when it's fake, you know. So, Sanatan turned to, to Ishan. He said, uh, give me those gold coins. So then he gave he didn't he there was eight gold coins, he gave him seven. And Sanatan didn't know how many were there, so he just gave he said, Give me whatever's there. So he gave him seven. And then he came to the hotel keeper and said, Here, I want to give you this. Said, oh, you're giving it to me. He said, Yes. He said the hotel keeper then he admitted, he said, I had a plan to rob you from all of this. And now you're giving it to me, but you're such a saintly person, I can see. No, no, you keep it. He changed his heart. But then Sanatana Goswami said, no, you take it and you arrange for me to get through the, the, the next area of passage because it's quite dangerous and give me protection, keep the gold coins. So he did. So he arranged it him and, and then Ishan. But then he could understand Ishan wasn't right. He said, Ishan, do you have any gold coins? He said, I have one. He said, why are you carrying that death knell? Take the gold coin and leave. So he let him go and then he traveled alone. And then he went through the forest. And while he was in the forest, you know, he had nothing to eat. So he was drinking water and he got bad water. So because he contracted this bad water, and he, his body broke out with all these different sores all over the body. And Prabhupada said they were oozing sores. There were wet sores and dry sores. These were wet sores. So now he came. And as he, as he, was, he was traveling, he... Uh, he had one valuable possession left. He had a nice blanket that he kept with him. So then he came to the door where Lord Chaitanya was staying, and he just sat there. And then Lord Chaitanya's assistant, I think it was Govinda, it might have been Govinda. He noticed that there was this Muslim sitting outside the door. So he went and said uh, to Lord Chaitanya, there's some Muslim mendicant outside the door. Lord Chaitanya said, that's not Muslim mendicant, that's Sanatan Goswami. Let him in. <laughs> so he came in and he, because he was quite shabby. He had long hair, he hadn't shaved, and he had, uh, you know, his body was, you know, contaminated with all these sores. And then, uh, Lord Chaitanya embraced him. And all the stories disappeared. His body became whole again. But Sanatana Goswami wasn't so happy that Lord Chaitanya had to touch his body with the body in his story, but he was feeling very unhappy. But then he kept looking at Lord Ch at Sanatana Goswami's blanket. And a lot of and I think Goswami can understand. He doesn't like my blanket. So he left and he went looking to get rid of his blanket. So he found his mannequin who had his old torn cloth. So he came up to him and said, I'd like to trade for your cloth for this blanket. And this person thought he was joking with him, thought he was just like making fun of him. He said, no, no, I actually, so they traded and then he came back. And Sanatana Goswami said, your last material attachment is gone. In other words, there was something left. Lord Chaitanya wanted him to move on completely. So the, the Goswamis were examples of, you know, renunciation. But there was another point. He called him a Dharavesh. Darvesh means hippie in a loose terminology. 
So because he was unshaven, long hair. But Prabhupada writes, you know, we shouldn't become Darvesh. We should be shaven headed. <laughs> Not for the ladies. <laughs> when la sometimes ladies would shave up and Bob would say, no ugly gopis. <laughs> he never liked the ladies. Some, you know, sometimes the ladies would get bold and shave up. He said, gopis are beautiful. No. <laughs> but he wanted the men to shave up. It's not like that. Of course, nowadays we don't shave up so much. But to keep a little bit of hair is not so bad. But still, we should shave every once in a while. I know that talking to those of you who work in the world is like, you're, you're threatening my job, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> but we say the guru saves you and shaves you. <laughs> First he shaves you, then he saves you. Is supposed to say. So the life of Sanatana Goswami is really exemplary in renunciation. There's much more to his pastimes. Today is his discipline. And of course, we honor Veda Vyas today as the original spiritual master within the Sampradaya. From Vyas comes Narada, from Narada, from, from Krishna comes Brahma, from Brahmana comes Vyas, from Vyas, no, sorry. Krishna comes Brahma, from Brahma comes Narada, from Narada comes Vyas. And then after that, the succession unfolds to the present day spiritual masters. So the, pro the purpose of, it's called Parampara, a Guru Parampara is to receive the knowledge as it is. And that's the that would that's what facilitates or qualifies one to be a spiritual master. They don't change anything. They may give realizations to that to that which is already understood to be knowledge. But they don't change. If you want to receive knowledge from the pure source, it has to be given in that same way. In other words, it has to come down to specific succession. So that is the idea. Sometimes we use the example, the fruit is on the top of the tree. You can't get the fruit. If you try to throw a rock at it or knock it with a stick, it may break, hit the branches, and that's right. That's right. So what you do is that people climb up and then they hand it down branch to branch until it comes to the receiver. The same way, this is Krishna is called Adi Guru. He is this original spiritual master. And he inspires that knowledge within the heart of Lord Brahma. And from there it unfolds into what we say a series of spiritual masters of the present day. So the spiritual master is actually coming into cyclic succession. Without that connection, one cannot actually act in the role of the spiritual master. It's fashionable, or sometimes it's may even say it's profitable to somehow become a spiritual master simply because one has some knowledge, one has some power, but no, that is not the qualification. It has to come into civil succession from Krishna. And there's four bona fide sampradaya, Sri Sampradaya, uh, the Kumara Sampradaya, the uh, well, Kumara Sampradaya is Lakshmi Sampradaya. You have Brahma Gaudiya Sampradaya, that's us. And then you have Rudra Sampradaya, Lord Shiva. Outside of these four sampradayas, there is no authorized bhakti process. Everything else that claims to be bhakti, but it's not within those sampradayas, has no standard. So we come there in Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya. Gaudiya means Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Thank you, Jaya. So that is our connection. So Sanatana Goswami is our uh, Sambandha Guru, that person who connects us with the process. Today is his discourse. And Vyasadeva is the incarnation of transcendental power. It's called Veda Vyas. Is it difficult? Would you like to sit in the chair? We have it. Here, take this chair. Sure? Okay. Good. Anytime you feel. Yeah. Sometimes we used to, people used to say, you guys always sit on the floor. Well, no, we actually have chairs. <laughs> Trying to get more people into the room when there's no chairs. So today is the, and it's called Guru Purnima. So really it's in honor of Vyasa. And anyone who comes in that specific succession is connected to that same principle of devotion or worship. There's so many teachers, but then there's master. So the word the word master comes from the word Prabhu. Prabhu means master. And then you have then you have Prabhupada, the master of the masters. And then you have Krishna who is Maha Prabhu. The so Prabhu means master. So there are many teachers, but there are very few masters. So it kind of designates a particular uh, quality of devotion where they are a representative of the Supreme Court. And one can take shelter of such persons and make progress in devotional service. Where there are many spiritual teachers, but that doesn't mean that they're connected to Krishna in, as a guide back to the spiritual world. That's different. Yes. Uh, yeah, he wanted to keep one. Yeah. Yeah. He kept one for himself. That's what happens when you have when you have greed or when you have assistance. You never know what they're gonna do. <laughs> He was he was a dedicated, but at the same time he got a little bit of greedy that cold cold. Nothing else. Swami gave away all those gold coins just so he could get free and meet Shaitani Mahaprabhu. Well, that was the only reason. Well, why did he take the well, and he was thinking this would get he get get us to where we were going. But when he had nothing, all he did was walk through the jungles. And that was difficult. And that's how he got sick. Um, 
Yeah, it really connects with the principle that the body belongs to the Lord. So to abuse the body or to enjoy the body separate is misuse of the property. To use it for devotional service is the best use. So it belongs to the Lord. to the Lord. They never belong to us. You can't say that my body belongs to us because everybody uses your body in a different way. Your boss uses it to engage in activities. The country you're in uses it to engage in different services sometimes like military so the body doesn't belong. There's a whole series of verses describing that ultimately the body belongs to the complete personality. So it doesn't belong to where do we get our body from our mother and father? So it belongs to so many different people at so many times in our life. But ultimately it belongs to Krishna because it's coming from his energy. So Lord Chaitanya, when Sanatana Goswami was actually overwhelmed with these sores, and Lord Chaitanya was embracing him, Sanatana Goswami was thinking, this is really difficult. And so he decided to commit suicide. So he was going to throw himself underneath the Rathi Archer part, which was coming up. And then Lord Chaitanya understood his mind and, and found him and said, Sanatan, you know, you're a thief. To take another pro person's property and then destroy it, you should be punished. That's what Lord Chaitanya told him. He said, I have plans for your body. Therefore, you can't destroy it. You'll destroy my plans. <laughs> and the Lord had plans for the different devotees to serve in different ways so he could spread his movement. So Rupa and Sanatana Goswami were there to, to excavate holy places and to, to produce transcendental literature. Yeah. So that was Lord Chaitanya's concern that, yeah, and then, of course, Sanatana Goswami, he accepted that chastisement and decided not to end his life. I'm a little tired. If I fall asleep while I'm, if you're talking, I'm still listening. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so tired. It's, we're fighting this thing. Maybe if I get a piece of cake, I could stay awake. <laughs> so, uh, not so big. Okay. This is not going to chance. No, no, we got it. Wow, this cake's good. <laughs> Better than the cake they have today. <laughs> and that was also good. You may. Yeah. I must have been. You must have been trained up in your last life. <laughs> this cake is good. Yeah. 
Which one is this? Walnut? Okay. And that's better on the wall. <laughs> Don't tell my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a super calibrated tragic equialidocious. <laughs> 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 Now I know you from the old school. <laughs> oh, I can eat the rest of this too. What else do you make? Figs. Wow, this cookie is ecstatic. It actually gives you love of God. <laughs> She does the, she does the whole thing herself. Puts on the sheet to you know the two pieces, and then she copies the recipe because I don't allow the screen time. She puts everything in the notebook, and every time she has to make it, she gets the notebook out. <laughs> she does the whole thing. She does the whole thing. Really. I don't go out of the house and just separate room because she makes a mess. That's everyone knows. Oh, yeah. It's a nice mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one scholar and one cook. <laughs> When she doubles it up, she gets confused sometimes, you know? If it's too kind of food, then she has to double it up to be last of other. Boy, what I did at your age was not as half as good as what you're doing. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I think my I think my my doctor's looking. Tell me no sweets. No. <laughs> no. But today was special. Today was special. Your cakes led me to eat the cookies. <laughs> you made some burfi, and what else you made when we were in uh, Pera? Pera? And there were some cookies too, right? Your son made cookies, and there were three things. Cookies? Oh you made what? Kaju. Kaju Burfi. That was really good.
Oh, I always used to go to your house and can't, couldn't wait for lunch. <laughs> yeah. Huh? I should, yeah. <laughs> I should do a lot of things. <laughs> Kind of like mixed eastern western there. She's <laughs> throws in the <laughs> Chinese. <laughs> he likes Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> to understand when you get the Indian's assistance, they tell you what to cook and they say it. Guru likes it, but they like it. Guru <laughs> needs <laughs> it. <laughs> it's it's a very good. Huh? What do you like to eat? Uh, what do I like to eat? Yeah. I, I used I used me. I'm a, I'm a I'm a like. What do I like? My favorite thing. You're asking me. You caught me at a weak moment. <laughs> I like spaghetti. <laughs> but I'm. I'm not supposed to eat tomato, <laughs> so, but I still do. My favorite dish is spaghetti. Tomato sauce. And you have to have durum, you know, the durum wheat, not just yeah. you know, what they these healthy the healthy pasta is the worst. You can sit on this chair. How about the What is that? If you make them from, from the beginning. So if you if you buy it, well, yeah, you make it, you make you make it. You can do it. You get these spaghetti makers, and they have you put them through, and it comes out these long strings. <laughs> No, no, no. My my eating days are over. I'm too old to eat. Kurumara, you said that the body is good. Yeah, it's good. So if you don't eat it, how can you maintain? Oh, I do eat. <laughs> I eat kitri, sabji, chapati. <laughs> Acha. <laughs> so many things. So which is your favorite sabji? Favorite sabji is. What's my favorite sabji? <laughs> favorite sabji is. That's why I cannot tell you. It's I like alu. spiritual spaghetti. I guess it comes from from higher above and comes down, right? Hmm. Oh, this is still online yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Rated R. <laughs> Restricted. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what I like? Are they Gujaratis here? Okay. Kandui. Kandui. <laughs> 
And today we had Rajma. <laughs> Any any uh, Punjabis here? Okay. <laughs> Punjabis here. Yeah. Rajma, Kanjali. Dukla. Dukla. It's very difficult to make it. No. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the only one I know who can make good Dukla is um, what's her name? Um, Vashanti. You know Vishanti? You know Vishanti, right? Uh, she used to be Krishangi, but then she became Vishanti. Near his mother. And then she has a brother who's also uh, Nandu. You know Nandu? Yeah, yeah Nandu's wife. Yeah, she's the best. Her, her dokla is. If you hold it in your hand, you can't even feel it. Oh, so wow. light, so. Then you put the coconut chart table. <laughs> <laughs> Purim Puri. Balati loves Purim Puri. My god sister, Peter god sister. Huh? Yeah, they're they're okay. But I I like I like uh, alu paratha. <laughs> but that's pretty heavy. Chik <laughs> And one of those in the night. <laughs> What's else in, in Jai Bhutta Maharaj's life? Uh, Tamron, let's see, what is it? The dried rice, what is it called? Mumra. I like ravioli and spaghetti and mochi and pizza. Yeah, I like like sandia. <laughs> but I can't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I love 5 kg in the last year. Last year. And if I study if I study again, again, again. <laughs> all that year's work will go back and be gone. <laughs> What do you eat every day for lunch and dinner? For breakfast, I have boiled apples with a few nuts and some dried fruit. That's breakfast. And sometimes maybe a little milk. And for lunch, kitchri or dal and kimma and sabji. That's all. And dinner? No such thing. Oh. <laughs> I don't eat at night. Generally, I because it keeps me awake. I just go sleep. You know, I don't need to eat to sleep. Like I just go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they say in Croatia, "Mama, brother." I don't eat at night. If I do, I'll take some puff rice, moody. Oh, okay. Or makana, you know makana, lotus buds, and fried in ghee with some turmeric. Oh, that's really first class. But you know what I really like? Butter and bread. We can eat that all day. 
But I gave up meeting because I'm not too old. <laughs> the things, the that, things we, that we used to do when we were young, we were young. <laughs> but you guys can still, still do. do. <laughs> <laughs> I just somehow, I just, I just somehow, I can I just eat the so I can maintain the body. If I were to eat for taste, if I were to eat for taste, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> What can you do? Can you do? Uh, so many years. So many years. Yeah, yeah Italian, Italian cooking, cooking is Indian, Indian, Indian cooking, cooking is the best in the world. world. And, and, and the Italian, 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 Everything. Everything. Even in the water. <laughs> you put it in the salad. Chili pizza. <laughs> Not chili. Too much. And Prabhupada said the best cuisine is Punjabi. Prabhupada said, said the best from Jesus. And then he, then he said, what was the second? He either said Bengali or Gujarati was second. I have, I'm not sure which one was. But, you know, <laughs> unequivocally, it was Punjabi was the best. Prabhupada said that. Well, Punjabi? I had a, I had a friend. He was an Indian. I don't know which where he was from, but he said, "I am never going to marry a Gujarati <laughs> because they put sugar in the dal." <laughs> Therefore, I'm not marrying a Gujarati. Guess what? He <laughs> married a Gujarati. <laughs> Krishna tricked him. <laughs> they put sugar in everything, don't they, the Gujarati? <laughs> When we used to travel on the train, uh, we used to get the chickies. The chicken wallow would come along and he'd be out of his fly in no time. People would buy chickies like crazy on the train. And so when I was one of my first things, I, I thought the only food in India was chickies. <laughs> When I first went to India, that's all I was eating was chickies. <laughs> chickies and nimbu party. Yeah. It's the best. Nimbu party is good. We know that I really like Rajma. That I can say I like. Sometimes they put tomato and sometimes not. Sometimes they put lemon. Mm -hmm. But with tomato, it's good. Yeah. Today they had it for the program today. But you know what's interesting? They, they put uh, rajma and dal together in one preparation. And it was really class. Best. Dal Magni. I just learned something. <laughs> and then when I was in Ujjain, 
I used to stay with Bhakti Churu Maharaj's place, and I was getting Ayurvedic treatment there. So they said, uh, every morning they were serving this called It's like cracked wheat. Yeah. Dahlia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really like that. That was good. Mm -hmm. Dahlia. You can have sweet, you can have sweet. I like it. I just like it without anything, but no sweet, no vegetables, just the dahlia. Just, yeah. That's nice. So they were giving it to us morning and the evening also. Sometimes. <laughs> It's light. It's good for evening. So I became a Dahlia fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When it is a Hindi song that in Kitchri you put, it's the song in Hindi. There's four things that go with Kitchri Achar, Papar. And Dahi. And there's a song in Hindi. They sing that song. You put one of these four. You know that song? Not my favorite song, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. One time I was at a class, and I was, this was in Chicago. So I said, uh, you know, I'm trying to tell the, and the, and the majority of the people in the congregation, which is a completely Indian congregation. So at the end of the class, you know, I was saying, she's the one lady says, oh, well, we don't eat any meat or fish, but is it right to have onion and garlic? So I said, G. No. No, 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 no. No. And she looked at me and I said, no, 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 no. I think that was, that was the last time she Ask me a question. <laughs> I had to say, that's the only way I could have said it. <laughs> if I would have said it in a different way, she would have never got it. <laughs> so that's, it was like, you know. <laughs> so she liked, I think, I think she, you know, might have considered my answer to be some well. Yeah, we discuss Prashad a lot sometimes. <laughs> I can't think of anything else that I like. Down to it, seriously speaking, anything that's nicely prepared and is offered with nicely with to Krishna, it's relishable. If something is nicely prepared, it really doesn't matter which cuisine it is, but if it's done nice with you know devotion and with you know expertise. Yeah. yeah, in the West, people can't understand why our food is so attractive because it's the bhakti. It's the bhakti that makes the difference. Sometimes they used to say, 
you know, can you give us your recipes? But then we tell them it's not going to make a difference because you can't, you know, because without the bhakti, it doesn't work. Yeah, we still give the recipes in the form of cookbooks. But they're thinking they can, can they can pattern it because they look at it from the point of view of ingredients. But sometimes something will not even be so tasty, but was, was prepared with bhakti, and it becomes really attractive, taste, tasteful. I saw that with Prabhupada, he did that a few times. It was one, Prabhupada would like hot chapatis right off the fire, and, you know, and still be puffed up, and, and then the steam would come out. <laughs> And then he put some ghee on it. And so there was one girl, she was preparing from a distance. And she was in another room. And she was really wanting to do it nice, but she kept burning the chapati. But she had so much bhakti that Prabhupada was taking every one of the chapatis. He didn't say anything, even though they had all these black marks on it. Because she was putting it on the grill and the grill was burning it and making marks in it. And sometimes the devotees didn't want to bring it to Prabhupada. The Prabhupada said, no, bring it back. Because he could understand she had she, she was cooking with a lot of bhakti. That's the difference. Yeah, it was in New Vrindavan in 1974. Yeah, probably came to see them. I joined in 73, probably the period of 74. I was at New Vrindavan. Uh, when I first connected in 1972, or you know, mostly, yeah. 70, beginning of 70. I would listen, but I wasn't able to understand everything Prabhupada said. His accent was too strong for me at first. But then after listening for a while, you get a little accustomed to it. And so I was, you know, I used to listen to Prabhupada, but I couldn't really understand everything in terms of the actual words too. But then mm -hmm. I saw about seventy four. He came to New Vrindavan, and he had a festival there, and that was the first time I saw him. Then I saw him again in seventy five in New York, in seventy six, and again in New Vrindavan. And that was it. Just about three, three times. I cooked for him once. You know what I cooked, right? Yeah. You know what I go there. Right? Another Vrindavan knows. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada ate my pear. I cooked. But we all cooked something for Prabhupada. I was the cook in the Brahmachari Ashma. So I made pear. I was making it for the Pedis. So, you know, I messed it up really bad. <laughs> but it got saved by Radhanath Swami. He said, that's a long story. <laughs> In other words, I, I made pear for Prabhupada, but it didn't come out. So I put it aside and I had some nice ones that I made for the deities. But when it came time to collect the sweets to give to Prabhupada, they were collecting it and giving it to the devotees to take it to Prabhupada. They couldn't find me. So they went looking for the pear in the kitchen and they find the one I put aside. And the one that I wanted to give to Prabhupada never happened. But somehow he liked the one, that one. Yeah, he ate three in a row. And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> really, special mercy. Yes.
I used to cook, believe it or not. I'm not so good a cook. I used to cook. My favorite cook thing was halibu. I used to mm. like halibu. And I, I used to cook all sweets. That's all I used to cook was sweets. I couldn't cook anything else. <laughs> and we try to cook like subjis, but when we diamond, all we had was we had cauliflower, we had potatoes, we had peas, we had tomatoes, and we had bell peppers. That's all. And then we had a thing called poke weed, which was a wild weed that was something like asparagus that was growing wild and we would gather that and make something. So my, I used to cook for the Didis and I'd cook cauliflower potatoes or eggplant tomato. And then for a little variety, I throw the peas in the cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> and for the variety of the other one, I put some bell pepper. <laughs> and I would make those every day. And so I couldn't make anything else. He did. Um, Mar Maraj was famous for sandesh. He made, he made beautiful sandesh, different kinds of sandesh. And Prabhupada liked it. Prabhupada took his sandesh. Very special sandesh. He would make these like layers, like squares, with layers. Then you have saffron layer, you have carob layer, and you have and then you have a plain layer and you make these deckers, you know, real beautiful looking. But he really put his heart and soul in making these. He did the whole thing from scratch. He would, you know, take the milk and then curdle the milk and then hang the cheese. And then after all the, all the liquid was out, then he would knead it and he would really knead it. So it became so fine and so like creamy that was mm -hmm. there wasn't even a spot of grain in there. Nothing. And then he would roll it into balls and then he would, you know, make his sandwich and, and of course and then put in the sugar. He was expert. Oh, but I said, this boy he makes the best sandwich. <laughs> He told Kirtananda Swami, he was the leader, he said, every time I come to New Vrindavan, I want, I want Radhanath Sandesh. <laughs> want to hear a funny story? The community was just getting involved. We had a school for kids for a while. We had a little girl call. But then it closed. And then for years there was no school. And then they decided to reopen the school. But then they needed money to get it started. So the, the first the devotee who wanted to, he was like the one that was pushing the whole idea of developing the school. So he decided to raise money by having an auction. So uh, Yeah. <laughs> Dipti, you can't do anything wrong, don't worry. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> and so we decided to have an auction. And then they asked me, because my para had gotten some recognition. <laughs> so they said, you cook para, and we'll auction that off. Radhana Swami should cook sandesh, we'll auction that off. So we, and then it was a couple other cooks that were making things. So I went in and I made a bunch of para. So Maharaj made 30 sandesh. 
So when it came time, they wanted to save Radhanath Swami's stand there. So, um, came up for bids. So, so uh, uh, I think it went for $150, which is not much. But then, again, then everyone was waiting for the big finale, rather than us when we sent that. So the bidding starts, and this is where it gets good. So, you know, it's going back and forth, $100, 150 200 250 300 350 400 450 500 550 600 Then it stopped, 600 So I was there, and I thought, you know, that Sandesh is worth more than that. <laughs> so I thought, um, I'd jump in, you know, kind of like shake things up a little. <laughs> so finally I was ready to say, and then somebody said, 610. So I thought, you know, we you gotta get at least a thousand for this one. So I said, 640. I did $640. And then it stopped. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to outbid me. <laughs> but I didn't. So they said, Maraj, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> huh? We had money. Money was never a problem. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was that was forty. That's forty years ago too. I mean, that was a lot more now. And so, and then I thought, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> and as soon as I, I, I got the sand dash, they gave me the whole thing. They said you're gonna have to pay in a couple of days. You know? <laughs> The devotees were run, running up to me and saying, I'll give you $50 for one piece. <laughs> so I sold three pieces and I managed to get $150 back. <laughs> so it came to something like $490. <laughs> and then I paid the $490 plus that. And then I was traveling, I was doing Sankirtan, and I was keeping the Sandesh in my car. I was in, I had a van and I had a, a seat underneath the van and I had a little box where the sand dish was. So every day I would eat one. <laughs> and so after a while I thought I had finished them all. And then a month later I happened to look under there and there was still one piece there. I didn't I had forgotten. And so I thought, wow, this thing's more than a month old. And there's no refrigeration. It was just underneath the seat of my car. But it looked good. <laughs> so I tried it. And it was just as good as it was the day it was made. But then I realized that Sandesh is not from this world. <laughs> It was 490. <laughs> I got 150 back. <laughs> I was trying to sell more, but nobody else would buy it. <laughs> so these were, you know, we would do that. They would, devotees would do these auctions and they, they would sell sacred articles, and raise money for the community. That's how we raised money. Because, you know, the, the Guri Hastas had money, but the temple had nothing. <laughs> Same situation now.
Was it Kalash? Don't want to give anything, so we have to figure out ways to get it. <laughs> figure out ways to get it. <laughs> Motivation to give what? process of, of dawn, charity, you give when you're inspired by something to give to. Give out of obligation is one way, and that's nice, but when you're inspired by something, you look for things that can inspire you. You think, oh, this is worthy to offer something, something that you that inspires you, some project, some some need. I used to run a preaching center, one city in America. And one of the one of the ways I would raise money is that I would take pictures of all the places in in the preaching center that needed construction. And I put it on the wall and I'd say please give to choose which one you want to give to. And that way we raised money. Because people, if you ask people to give, it's not going to work. But if you have something specific and you inspire that in different ways, people are attracted more. I don't think you need it. Have to you have to expand in co in, in relationship to the congregation. If the congregation is not expanding, then the temple should not expand. If, if is it too small for what you need right now? Renovated. But it costs a lot to build them up. And, and what do you think? That, uh, I mean, Vrindavan now? Yeah. Uh, the temple is kind of shaped like more wider and that way you can facilitate more people and you can also kirtans would be more complete yeah but raising money takes some time and then building <laughs> I 
Oh, that was for breakfast. Yeah, we used to have, I used to, we cooked on wood. We didn't cook on gas. It was only wood stoves. And it's much, I mean, there's much flavor, more flavor than food. Yeah. Of course, we had rough times in the winter time when the wood was wet. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I cooked on wood. So I had a, a stove and I had a huge frying pan that was as big as the stove. But it was all dented in the middle. <laughs> I mean, it was long. It was like the frying pan on the bottom was like this with a long handle. And I would throw oats in there and then try to toast it. <laughs> but because the, the bottom was bent, thick, and then you get these black oats. <laughs> and I would tell them that's raisins. <laughs> 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 only uh, only one time <laughs> but then after a while we were putting some raisins in it we actually put peanuts in it so we used to get these government surplus peanuts we because we were a non-profit organization we had these food banks and people would donate food to there. Then you could go and you could, for one day a week, you could go and take whatever food you wanted, whatever they had. So we would take peanuts and then I would add that to the oats and fry it. But <laughs> uh, my theory was that brahmachari shouldn't have too much protein. Because then they become grihastas. <laughs> <laughs> so, I used to put uh, eight peanuts per person. <laughs> I multiplied the amount of devotees times eight, and then I would put that many peanuts. <laughs> but then there was a revolution. <laughs> They said, you know, we want more peanuts. <laughs> so I was fighting and then I got overruled. So then I had it, I pushed it up to 13 peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow it worked. <laughs> and the devotees would get there first for breakfast, they would go for the peanuts, you know. <laughs> for breakfast, we used to, they all we had was hot milk and toasted oats. That's all. But oats are like, you know, good energy with milk. And the devotees were building, that's when we were building Prabhupada's palace. They used to work really hard. It was good hard working food. I mean, when we first joined the Hare Krishna movement, we didn't really know anything. We still don't know so much. <laughs> The first time they gave us, they said this was dal, but it wasn't. They would take split pea, the green peas, and make it, and it was pea soup, and they called it dal. <laughs> so I didn't even know what dal was until many years later, until I went to India. <laughs> I was eating split pea and thinking it was dal. <laughs> and that's heavy. And we had chapatis with no butter, rice with no vegetables, and no salt. <laughs> <laughs> that was lunch. Split pea soup, chapatis without butter, and rice. That was it. No subject. And then it was all stare. That was back in 1974. Maha was great. <laughs> Maha was good. Because we had a lot of cows and we could, we could make a nice, a lot of nice milk. 
So the milk sweets were offered to the deacon. Generally, the devotees didn't get hardly anything. I get most of the that's another story. <laughs> I don't want to tell that. <laughs> yeah, it's because there was no sense gratification, so Prashadam was the only of my times, nothing, there was nothing available in between breakfast, lunch, and then at night. At night was popcorn and milk. So the devotees were drinking. I mean, we had the milks were like really creamy, coming from the cows, really tasty. The devotees were drinking a lot of milk and we all got sick. The Prabhupada came right after that and said, you're drinking too much milk. Then he gave the form and he said, of course, we had to undergo some austerity. Because of that, we got sick. We one doctor came in. He was a, he was an Indian doctor. He put us on oh no, he put us on dal water and rice. That's all. Every meal, just you cook the dal in a lot of water and you strain it. The beans get pushed aside and you get the water and rice. Oh boy, that was miserable. <laughs> we did that for weeks because we were all kind of sick from drinking too much milk. And then again, Prabhupada later said that no more than one pound, no less than one half pound of milk products daily. And he still, you can hear it on one of his lectures, he also mentioned one pound if you go for ounces. 17.2 ounces. You take the half of that and that's the minimum. And then Prabhupada qualified it. He said combined. That means whatever you take in milk products shouldn't exceed that quantity. That means if you're taking yogurt, taking milk, if you're sweet rice, whatever you're taking, should not be more than that. So milk is really a miracle food in small quantity. The reason why people get sick like that from milk is they take too much milk. It's really good in small quantities, yeah. Um, very much. Um, Violent. Yeah. So, um, as the My god sister just published a book. It's going to come out. It's called The Milk Issue. And it's about 80 pages. Basically, the, the GBC has discussed this and they've came up with a Jadmastami 2022, every temple should have a plan for getting only a hymns and milk products. So I don't, I generally don't take any milk. I don't take any milk unless it's a him. Any milk from outside, you're actually supporting the meat industry. The meat industry and the milk industry is very much connected in economic stuff. So, because the meat industry works with the milk industry, and then when the milk they can't, the cows can't produce anymore, they give them to the meat, to the meat people. The cows get killed. So, I don't believe in taking uh, milk products that are not our products. So Prabhupada wanted that, but we're a little slow in doing that. Getting to the point of the hymns of milk, the hymns of cheese, the hymns of butter, hymns of ghee. Yeah, otherwise we're hypocritical. But the idea of just refraining from milk altogether doesn't fit into 
Prabhupada's instructions, and I also agree with that, because he does say milk nourishes finer brain tissue. It's necessary for spiritual life. But small quantities. That's all you need. The body doesn't need much. Something for nourishing bones, nourishing the brain. And I was thinking about this much milk every day in the morning. That's all, just enough to get a something. And I found it nice. You take a lot of milk, sometimes it makes you tired later. Or becomes hard to digest. Generally, not recommended large quantity. So we got sick, and when Prabhupada came in, he made that statement. And then we put on that diet. Miserable. Dal water, mung dal water, rice. And, and then, you know, in Krishna consciousness, we look forward to prasadam. So we were thinking there's nothing to look forward to. <laughs> and sometimes we just eat a lot of rice, and, but it doesn't really satisfy us. And that was because we were sick. I mean, definitely we were sick. Uh -huh. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I just had an evening meal. That was a cake. That was nice. When I saw the pineapple on the top, I thought, what is this? But then, but then when I tasted it, it was something, something very sublime. What time is it? You want to put me to bed at six? <laughs> well, the thing is, I am tired. That doesn't matter. Well, it's on uh, the 29th, Thursday. Yeah, well, uh, the day before the 28th is Gopal Bhatta Goswami's. Yeah, but I will, yeah, so we'll speak on that. On. Okay. Yeah, so I'll also be home with Sunday for me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm going to do the house for me to take a demand and cook with me. Not sure if it's going to happen, but at least. <laughs> well, we can start at six, six, yeah. Okay, wait. Is that too, too early? You have to come a long way. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Write some more. You make two kinds of cookies. You make uh, walnut and what else? Fantastic. I mean, you know, a piece of chocolate chip, and I'm not going to. <laughs> By who? No, no, who? Who's telling me I can't eat it? Is it God? Is it God? God is saying it. Guru Bhakti says I can't have it. Put camera down, not camera. We'll call her a guru bhakti. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't tell anybody, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Be cooks. <laughs> Krishna cars in so many pastimes with cooking. They used to call us the kitchen religion. <laughs> really? I know how many hours I used to spend in the kitchen every day. Average, 11 hours straight. I used to go in like in the morning and I do the breakfast offering. And then I get out and take breakfast and come back in. And I go back in and then I take lunch, go back in, stay afternoon. And all the way up to nine o'clock in the I was the head cook and the only cook. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no competition <laughs> and no help either. <laughs> it was an old wooden farmhouse. You can see it, it's still there. And you, you saw it, right? Did you go to Newburn Island and saw the city? Smoke, yeah. I lost my eyesight at one point because of the smoke from the wood. And then they called in this Ayurvedic doctor, the first Indian I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and he was good. He said, take some honey and mix it with some warm water. 
where it's still, you know, still a little bit like it keeps the honey that, uh, with consistency. And you rub it on your eyes, close your eyes. And you do that a couple times a day for a half hour each time. And okay, after a few days, my eyes were back on the eye. Then you close it. Honey, and so you have sweet eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that because I used to offer artsy sometimes, and we had a big chandelier in the middle of the altar, and it was so bright I couldn't even see the deities. I was trying to offer my eyes would be, you know, it's the brightness from the chandelier. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I was so strong. It was funny watching me off an RT. What could I do? You know, I couldn't see. It worked. And honey and water. It's nice. Yeah, there's a Ayurveda is the best. Okay. Uh, I gave a class. I think, a while back <clears throat> about the allopathic and Ayurveda, mm -hmm. I remember. But there was one devotee in Ireland, Krishna Chaitanya. My mother, he was, you know, he lived most of his life in India. He said, my mother was an allopathic doctor. But when it came to treating the family, she would use Ayurveda. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you can't get much money from working as an Ayurvedic doctor. But she knew Ayurveda was superior in all respects. The Ayurveda is, you know, Dhanvantari. Dhanvantari is an incarnation of Vishnu. So it is called, you know, Ayur means longevity of life, longevity of life. Ayurveda. I mean, Ayurveda is so good that nobody can do this, but it's an Ayurvedic treatment. They can turn an old person into a young person. They can, you can take a 70 year old man and bring him back to the age of 20. But what you have to do to do that, nobody can do. Okay. It's like, yeah, it's. I, I mean, I spoke to Ayurvedic doctors. A couple of them told me, you go into this arranged dark place and you stay there for nine months. You don't see anybody. And they bring you milk with herbs mixed in a certain way. And that's what you take for nine months. And that's the only person you contact is the person who brings you nine months. And I asked one Ayurvedic doctor, the one that's in, has anybody done it? He said one man did it for one month. <laughs> that he knows of. So yeah. it's, but it does, it, it is an Ayurvedic treatment that you can, can actually bring you back to youth from old age. You want to try it? <laughs> <laughs> Nine months. <laughs> He would not symbolize is the womb also. It's like being reborn again. Mm -hmm. right. so how much do you get ten years less? Huh? How much do we get ten years less? Something. I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ayurveda is the best. And I, I always ask the Ayurvedic doctors, why, if Ayurveda is so good, why don't people take it? Everybody goes for allopathic or some other form. It's because it's long term and people cannot undergo the, the regimen. They want something quick. But it's more effective because it gets right to the root of the problem. 
and they use the original Ayurveda uses mantras also for part of it. They use mantras, certain medicines, but one of their biggest forms of curing you is diet. It's all based on diet, giving you the proper food that balances your three doses. When the three doses are balanced, your health is good. And it's all based on digestion. Where allopathic medicine is just, they look for symptoms, they give you a pill. Hopefully, here, good luck, $10, please. <laughs> it's experimental. All, all allopathic medicine is experimental. The only, I asked one Ayurvedic doctor, what is allopathic good at? He said pathology and surgery. That's all. They can do, they can do operations generally, or they can heal broken bones and stuff like that. Pathology means analyzing blood. So they can take your blood and see what's wrong. But for cures, they're terrible. <laughs> I can't cure anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You're a doctor? <laughs> it's good. Here's your medicine, but if you want the real stuff, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ayurveda uses medicines too. They use different kashayans and some rasayans. They have to go. That's the last verse in number. How many verses do you know in, in, in chapter two? That's the only one? If you can read it, so you have to read all, I think there's like two verses. Mm -hmm. That is on like this program. Mm -hmm. Switch to the and his friend can do the switching. It's not a devotee thing. We're trying to, you know, every one child, every week, whenever we can. Mark the sparses to Kuntaya. Sit those. The number of parents. <laughs> yeah. You are traveling and preaching. <laughs> That's how we learn verses. When we used to travel to go place to place, we learn verses while we were traveling. It was we use travel time just to learn verses. Uh, Hare Krishna Is that the floor must be really hard. Mm -hmm. 
It looks low. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> We're over practice. <laughs> Are you coming to the Kirtan program on the 9th? Gopal, you know Gopal? He's getting married. There's a kirtan program in, in Manor on the 9th, I think. I can invite you. <laughs> well, he's getting married on the 11th. Ninth, he said the 9th. Ninth is a Monday, 11th is a Wednesday. Evening kirtan, I think, for a couple hours. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe they'll hold it in the valley. Mm -hmm. It doesn't match you. Either. Mm -hmm. you forgot? Mm -hmm. And that's not how many hours? Uh, from seven thirty to from there after two to nine. Oh, okay. I have to. Find it. Might be hard. My this Wednesday is filled, and the next Wednesday is codicy, and the next Wednesday after that is the marriage. Yeah. I have to. Well, the point is, I have to go to Soho at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> Yeah, Jagannath is the star of the show, though. The best. Tomorrow? I'm invited to go to Janakina's parents' home for lunch. So it's a conflict. I I took them the uh, program at the house, and then I learned about the translation. So. What to do? You do for bathing. For bathing. If I come, I have to come at eleven. <laughs> That's the time for the snanyatra, 10.30. Well, that's even better. Well, then I can come. But I made this promise with the family, so it has to happen again. When they're also going again on Wednesday, there's a thing called Kriya. Know what that means? It's 11 days after. That's that's on Wednesday. Oh, let's see. Well, maybe you can. Okay, you can go in my room. My key to get in. In the closet, in the closet, you'll see a container of sweets. Mm -hmm. 
This is my roommate. Is anybody left online? They're all probably sleeping now. <laughs> Hare Krishna Mataji, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Prabhupada, all glory to Gurudev. Do you want to close the call, uh, Mataji? Yeah, yes, if Guru Maharaj uh, is busy and uh, is safe, but I think we can end. I can't hear you, Mataji, for some reason. Uh, I'm sure. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, if Guru Maharaj uh, is busy and uh, he, he has nothing to say for us, uh, then I think we can end the call here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Mataji, thank you so much for your association. Thank you. Thank you. you are all having, having a wonderful time. Please take some pictures and post in the group. <laughs> yes, sure. We have got some videos. We will send it in the group. Thank sure. you so much. Thank you so much. Jai. 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 Happy Guru Purnima to all the God family. Happy thank Guru Purnima. Hare Krishna.